my camera is now on 2013 article uh, religion and politics which is a critique of the leadership styles of Robert Mugabe and uh, Ezekiel Good. But before I ask you the questions with regards to your article, uh, could you just briefly uh, uh, tell us the work that you do, uh, the courses that you teach, um, and, and the broader research focus uh, that you engage in the academia at Bambeg University? Uh, I'm a lecturer in the Department of Religious Studies, Classes and Philosophy, University of Zimbabwe. I specialize in African indigenous religions, and I also teach religion and ethics. But currently here in Germany, I'm doing uh, my research. I am on Alexander von Humboldt research, and I'm not teaching. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I am researching on the interpretation of the Bible uh, by Pentecostal churches in Harare uh, with regards to the welfare of single women. I'm looking at the resilience of the indigenous uh, spiritualities and how they inform this interpretation, their attitudes and the approach towards the interpretation of the Bible and the deployment of sermons within specific Pentecostal churches in Arari. Oh, wonderful. You are doing a very good job. Wonderful. That's great. Uh, uh, so, so uh, Professor Kudzi, um, how do you balance the equation of being mm -hmm. uh, an objective academic uh, and as well as being a born-again principled Christian? It's not difficult. <laughs> um, I can say it's not really difficult to balance my academic work, being um, born again, being born again or being a believer. It's just like somebody who is born again, who advances in education. That's the simple thing. But I have to admit that sometimes it's not easy. Yes, being an academic, widens my horizon, it widens my scope of analysis. Mm -hmm. For example, when I'm in the church, when the gospel is preached, I don't just embrace everything. I subject everything to analysis because I have to be critical of my own faith tradition in order to see whether I'm doing the right thing at the right time, with the right people, at the right place, and for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. Therefore, my uh, academic work has actually helped me to be very critical of everything that comes across my way. If I were there, or if I were part of the congregants that were told to drink petrol by the pastor, because God had decreed, obviously I would not, because I would question that. I would question the validity of that, and I know I don't have a fuel tank in my, in my tummy. Then what kind of a God tells me to drink petrol? What kind of a God tells me to graze as if I am a cow, I can show the card? So these are the things that I find my academic work very useful because I do research, I observe, I see, I participate. And at the end of the day, it gives me um, a clear picture of what I should do at a particular time. But I admit it's not that simple, Mr. Chikumbo, because sometimes you find it's not really easy Yes, being born again, being a believer in the church, there is a level in which the church is suspicious about intellectuals. Mm -hmm. Do they have the capacity to be dedicated Christians, to be dedicated believers? And sometimes you find by virtue of simply being an academic, someone is not comfortable to deliver a sermon because you might be a big, big guy at the university, in the classroom. Therefore, when he's teaching, she must be marking my sermon. Okay, yeah. In the Bible study, I remember sometime back when I contributed because it was a controversial subject. Hmm. 
the quick response was, no, it's not about uh, PhDs. Oh. It's about the spirit of God. So you see that kind of thing. You need to be strong enough to assert your independence and at the same time submit to the authorities. I know I'm not alone on this one. It's not really easy to balance at times. I remember 2014 when I was in uh, Jerusalem with other scholars from all, all over Africa. We're sharing the same problem. Sometimes we experience that push in our churches for some reasons because these are myths handed down from generation to generation that academics or intellectuals are simply there to be critical, to question. And you know, most of our churches don't want people to question. So this is one of the ills of being, you know, in some of the churches where you are an academic and at the same time you're born again. Yeah. But all the same, I enjoy being an academic and being born again because I'm born again and I, I made a decision to follow Jesus. Therefore, I have to embrace whatever comes my way. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. I see. Uh, thank you very much for that response, uh, Professor Kudzi. Um, now, let, let's get to the article that you wrote. I've seen that uh, it has received a lot of reviews. It has received a lot of uh, readership on, on so many sites. It's a very critical article. Um, but my first question about you and about the article is that why, why did you choose to write about uh, the former president, Robert Mugabe, uh, and the founder of uh, the Zayuja uh, Church, Ezekiel Guti, specifically in 2013? Okay. I specialize in African traditional religions and Christianity, but specifically on African Pentecostalism. So you can't do justice to Pentecostalism and the whole of Southern Africa and ignore the apostolic faith mission in Zimbabwe and also Zayoja. These are some of the oldest Pentecostal churches in the region. And when you consider the history of Pentecostalism, you cannot afford to ignore Zayoja and you cannot afford to ignore the apostolic faith mission. Now on focusing on Guti and Mugabe, it was because of many reasons. I teach religion and politics component of my, my curriculum. Therefore, I could not ignore, do something on Pentecostalism and ignore Zayoja Forward in Faith. I decided to carry out a comparative analysis of the two because the, you can compare the theology of Guti and the ideological stance of Robert Mugabe. For example, I was fascinated by Robert Mugabe's indigenization programs, his staunch anti-West stance, his advocates on the empowerment of the black people. At the other hand, I would look at Ezekiel Guti, his advocates on the empowerment of the indigenous people through talents, working talents, Matarenda, mm -hmm. his negation of the superiority of the white race and advocating the empowerment of the indigenous people. So there is resonance in good theology of empowerment and that which was propounded by Robert Mugabe. Again, I sought to establish why they were so strong on their ideologies. It dates back to the colonial era. Both men are almost of the same age. They had bad experiences during the colonial era. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. this could have shaped Ezekiel Guti's theology of empowerment and the importance of the black race. And sub being subjected to torture during the colonial era could have shaped Robert Mugabe's anti-West stance and his call for the empowerment of the indigenous people. So there are a lot of areas that are comparable. Apart from politics then, I would also consider their approach to gender issues. There are so many areas of resonance and this attracted me as an academic 
focusing on African Pentecostalism, teaching religion and politics to bring these two together and analyze them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, I see. I see. Wonderful. Wonderful. What a great insight. What a great insight. Now, I hear that you mentioned gender. Um, and I also noticed in the article that there is a very strong, uh, a constant reference to gender uh, and religion and to religion and politics. Why are these major themes important? Gender and religion, and gender and politics are central in our day-to-day -day lives. Gender and politics have the capacity to stabilize or destabilize families, communities, and the nation. Look at Zimbabwe right now, the mess we are in. It's because of politics. Look at the crisis in families that revolve around gender. So to me, I saw the importance of focusing on gender and politics. Why? Because no one could question the influence that Robert Mugabe had in the political space, not only in Zimbabwe, but beyond the borders, the whole continent. He stood as an icon. No one questioned the influence and the status of Ezekiel Guti as a great African theologian within the Pentecost of fraternity and even beyond. No one would question the numerical strength of Zayoja, mm -hmm. the theology, the influence of the theology. I say it's just that this is part, it's an article that's taken from the, a book on African Pentecostalism and cultural resilience. Mm -hmm. In other words, Guti is representing many Pentecostal leaders who came after or broke away from Zayoja directly or indirectly. And Guti has influenced so much in terms of theology in Zimbabwe when we look at the newer Pentecostal movements in terms of orientation and style. So we can't afford to ignore the influence of Guti within the uh, Pentecostal fraternity and in a broader framework. Uh, and then Christianity in Zimbabwe. So it was necessary for me to bring the two together because the source of our problems or the source of our success emanate from politics and religion. So it was uh, proper for me to um, investigate Pentecostalism and uh, politics at the same time. And I chose Pentecostalism for a reason, Pentecostalism has, be, uh, has become a global phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Not only in Zimbabwe, we cannot ignore the influence of Pentecostalism in our politics. Mm -hmm. Not only in Zimbabwe, but throughout the whole continent. The reason why people make a lot of noise, why people press upon the Pentecostal leaders in crisis like now in Zimbabwe, is because they know the power they have, the authority that they command, the influ influence that they've uh, exerted in our societies. So Pentecostalism being a very powerful religious movement, I thought it has the capacity to empower or disempower the nations by virtue of the congregants that are very loyal to them. Why I was looking at Mugabe, at, right at the apex of the nation, and I look at Ezekiel Guti right at the apex within the Pentecost of fraternity. And obvious by virtue of these statuses, they have authority, they have power. So there are a lot of things that are comparable with regards to the two. Okay, oh, I see. Thank you very much for that response. Uh, now, uh, what are your views specifically about uh, gender issues in Pentecostalism? especially represented by, by, by the Zayoja Forward in Faith, that that is the, one of the oldest uh, Pentecostal church movements in the country. Gender issues in Pentecostalism are very controversial. They are not uniform. We cannot really blanket them. But at least across the board, my conclusion is that Pentecostalism in general Expouse a very weak gender ideology. Mm -hmm. On one hand, 
they have empowered the women in particular to work to be self-sufficient to be hard work look at how we advance the proverbs 31 woman the woman from Gala who submits to her husband yeah. without questioning the head and so forth the teachings are noble but i have a query to me, there is lack of balance because Pentecostalism does not really empower women what to do. If this woman marries a bastard, a violent man, yeah. does she have to take it always to the prayer? That isn't it? She must act. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you do with the aberrant husbands? Those who run away from the family, they don't pay rent house, they go to the so-called, you know, concubines, whatever, they spend money there, and you are told you fight the war through prayer. Yes, prayer should be a lifestyle of every believer, but what lacks for me is the courage to confront the aberrant husband mm. and call him to accountability and responsibility. At the end, this woman becomes a sacrificial victim who suffer injustice, but at the same time, she's always told to pray and pray and pray. So that is one of the semi sides of Pentecostal gender ideology. There are also men who are abused by women. We always think that it's only the women who abuse, uh, men who abuse women. But we have many men who are abused, but they fear to come out. Why? Because of the socialization, because of culture. We love. How can you not be beaten by a woman? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We yeah. only acknowledge that when a man has been, you know, banned by a pot of oil, cooking oil. That's when we raise our eyebrows. But many men die in silence. Why? Because they have been silenced by culture based on the masculinities that we have in our account. So when it comes to gender issues, I'm saying Pentecostal churches do a very good thing to teach women. I'm emphasizing women because gender is not about women. It's about men and women, but there is a bias towards women. Our women go to choose their meetings, Chipiri. They go to face their meetings, China. They go to church on Friday, Kuchishanu. They go on Saturdays, Sabata. Mm -hmm. And my question that I've always asked is, where are the men? Yeah, yeah. If you run with the woman, teaching her, empowering her, what happens when that empowered woman, woman meets that man who is not empowered? Yeah. Does it mean the Proverbs 31 woman who has to be a hard worker, be silent in abuse when this man, the head, is abusing her. And she must not question the head because this man, this head is the perfect shoe. And my question is, what if the shoe is itching? Do you have an option for me? Yes, I've been praying and praying, but things get worse. What do I do? So there is a degree in which people are not really empowered. And, you know, it actually encourages gender-based violence. Somebody, because violence is not only beating me, when I'm subjected to psychological torture, it's abuse. Somebody carries the burden. I was saying to somebody, we risk having a fatherless generation. I know there are so many good men out there. So many accountable and responsible men out there, but one of the weaknesses of Pentecostalism is how they mediate gender issues. They mostly source from the traditional paradigm without considering the context. Therefore, to me, if it is an ideology that does not any empower an individual to resist exploitation yeah. and oppression it ceases to be go to be the gospel yeah. that's where my take is that's why i'm focusing on gender and politics the wars we have the arguments we have the fight we have center on politics and gender within the framework of gender 
any teaching, teachings on submission are noble, they are good. I don't query the biblical text, but my worry is on how they are interpreted and deployed mm -hmm. to the congregants. This is where my issue is because calling one person to carry the burdens while I'm told I will have the reward of motherhood in heaven is nonsense to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want you to bring this woman to responsibility. I want you to bring this man to responsibility. They should be accountable for their actions. But we hide behind prayer and the reward in heaven. We want to feel the good life here on earth. The family should not be battlegrounds because teaching one person is not enough. Teach all of them. Yeah, yeah. The same applies, I see even the Christian chief parties. This girl goes through seasons of empowerment, being taught, and so forth. And we have our bachelor's parties, who go to and so forth. Mm -hmm. But they do not really match with what women and girls are subjected to. The kinds of teachings, the emphasis you put on the woman and the girl child, put them to the men and the boys to catch them young. Because we socialize them in a wrong way mm -hmm. to say it doesn't matter for the men to go to church. It's not saying the verbal message, mm -hmm. but actions, your silence on that is complicity. Mm -hmm. But if they are the head of the families, we want to see male pastors going out, calling men to come in their numbers, calling men to be responsible, calling men to be accountable. And at the end of the day, we have a powerful generation of girls and boys, powerful generation of men and women, because we've been balancing our teachings. In relation to this outside the church, that's why I was advocating last time to say, yes, we need, we appraise the work of the girl child network. They've done a good job because of the abuse that the girls face. But we need to review all our approaches at any given time. Are we not risking holding the girl's hand and running with her mm. and leaving the boy child? Yeah, Boys are abused, but all these things sometimes remain in the dark because our focus is only on the girl child. I believe it's high time we need to hold the hand of both the boy child and the girl child and run together with them because life is about partnering. I was saying probably we are different with the Western feminists is that as African women, is, we are not saying we don't need these men. We are aware of the challenges. We are aware of the patriarchal issues. But as I always say, we love our men. We want our men. We need our men. We like our men. They are our brothers, our sons, our husband, our grandfathers. There's a problem. We summon them to the dialogue table. Issues have to be dealt with. They have to be discussed. That's why even the issue of gender-based violence, I say, men have to play a pivotal role. It doesn't work to say we as women only, we can fight gender-based violence. It takes bringing men and women together, yeah. socializing the boys and the girls together, repairing those damaged men who think Women are sexual objects. So coming together will actually help us to go forward and fight gender-based and sexual violence in a way that every member of the church, every member of the community is empowered. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. What an informative and insightful uh, uh, article and as well as uh, so, so many um, critical and central themes that you raise uh, around the issue of of Pentecostalism. But now, um, what is the general attitude of Pentecostals towards politics? I've seen that there's been a growing uh, discontent around the issue of Pentecostalism in Africa. And uh, it's not only a Zimbabwean thing, but even in Africa at large, there's been this growing discontent. What, what, what is the attitude of Pentecostals towards politics? That outcry 
and with a specific focus on Pentecostalism speak volumes on its own. In my analysis and conclusion, Pentecostalism advanced a weak political theology. If you are not careful, it, is, it becomes one of the worst forms of capitalism. I say so because any theology that empowers congregants to endure suffering is not gospel. Any theology that empowers the oppressed to keep on hoping that God will redeem them one day is not the gospel. Any theology that empowers the believers not to question, they are not empowering believers, but they are disempowering the believers. Because the congregants have the right to question you can't just do things for the sake of doing just because everybody is doing the things. Therefore, I have to know. You have to question why and you have to know why you are doing this thing at a particular time. Back to our churches, I have carried out extensive research and interviewing people during uh, elections or before elections. Haven't you have heard about people saying, our leader said, you are voting for. I remember very well during the time of President Robert Mugabe. One day I had a heated debate, uh, debate with a lady. She says, our men of God told us to vote for Baba Mugabe because God said we should vote for him. And I'm looking at the person. She's a doctor. And I asked her, Attaining a university degree means to me, you can think for yourself, you can question for yourself, and you have the right to exercise your own rights. Why should somebody tell you who to vote for? And she says, we can't do anything because that is what our leader has said, you see. And I had to question the same person after the coup in um, 2017. Yeah. If this yeah. man was God, mm. so Zimbabweans overthrew God. Yeah, yeah. The will of God, yeah. They overthrew the will of God. Yeah. So you see how sometimes, you know, the attitude, a leader who tells the congregants, the individual to vote, is criminal. Yeah. Congregants have, have every right to vote for who they want. Yeah, yeah. It's destroying their mental capabilities. You are ripping them of their right to vote for who they want. A closer look, that's when you find this person, this leader, his home was electrified. He has everything. So as a result, that's why he tells the congregants to vote for this. But they never benefited. I'm languishing in poverty. Yeah. I have my grievances. I have to take my grievances to the ballot box. So you see how leaders us usurp the congregants of their right to exercise their will. So this is one aspect. On the other hand, there is contradiction within the Pentecost of fraternity in their approach to politics. I've heard people making noise saying, we want righteous leaders, those people, sense of authority. We want the Christians. We want born again people. But these are the leaders again, some of them, we are talking in, in generic terms. Yeah. Some of them prevent their congregants to go and vote, prevent their congregants to speak out when things are not well, yeah. shine away from politics. So, in my assessment, the political, uh, the religious leaders need to think, need to stand up and do what I saw a few days ago. A Pentecostal leader in West Africa he had the courage to stand up and say, to hell with the government decrees. Mm. They can't dictate what they want on us. Yeah. Especially when it conflicts with the right things that have to be done in society. I personally appraise the Catholic bishops during Mugabe era. 
they spoke out against injustices. And at the end, there were sidelines and the African independent churches, the white gown churches, and the Pentecostals filled that vacuum that was left by the critical Catholic bishops. Yeah. Why? Because the Catholic bishops were straight to the point. They denounced the evils in our nation. Mm -hmm. And there were some people who were willing to compromise and dine with those who were perpetrating violence. You see, so at the end, I remember Mugabe saying, church leaders do church things and shut up. Mm -hmm. And I thought religious leaders would rise up in unity to say no. Yeah. Why? Because we saw these politicians coming to our churches and campaigning on the pulpit. Mm -hmm. We saw them putting on white garments in the wilderness of Maso, mm -hmm. preaching and campaigning. And these religious leaders are told to sh shut up and they were quiet. Mm -hmm. So that quiet, uh, that silence, when there is injustice, is complicit. And they can I have heard some people saying, no, we are neutral. There's nothing like neutral. If you are neutral, you are siding with the oppressor. You are siding with the exploited. So there's no neutrality. Yeah. You have to tell us your decided position. Mm -hmm. So I observe the ongoing trends in our churches different. Remember, I'm not talking of one church here now. Mm -hmm. When congregants are so blind, this is where my academic parts, I celebrate it because I'm not a blind follower. I take things that I want and I refuse to take things that I don't want. Those which are meaningless to me, I don't. A very good example, in our society is how congregants fight for their own. They fight to defend men and women of God on their own. And my question is, when men and women of God are silent, why do you congregants speak? Mm -hmm. Why do you come to their defense? Let them defend themselves. Let God defend them. Why I say so, I'm not that is because I think it's criminal to defend a person when I don't spend 24 hours with you, seven days a week. How do I know your day-to-day -day runnings? So when I jump in to defend you, I've seen people defending a man of God. He never stole. He never took money for the residential stands. I think this was trending on social media. Then the next thing the man of God says, I'm going to repay your money. Oh. What is that? It teaches us to hold on. When there is a crisis, it's important to see how we trade. Let them defend themselves. Let's not cause chaos by fighting on our own. Let them defend themselves. So commenting on this, on these attitudes towards politics, you'd find our people have been brainwashed to an extreme extent. Yeah, yeah. Their brain. Well, I was telling the people that if we have just two Pentecostal leaders, who we'll tell the congregants tomorrow to go into the streets, despite the fact that the army have got guns, they will go. I tell you, you'll be shocked. Yeah. Don't underestimate the power that religious leaders have on their congregants. That's why even women become easy prey for sexual abuse because the man of God made advances. She, she was quiet. So they become easy targets because the congregants have exonerated the man of God to an infallible position where he has become a little God. Yeah. Above God himself and he cannot be queried. He cannot be questioned. That's why people graze eating grass. That's why people drink petrol. That's why women are sexual abuse because they have no capacity to question. That's why I said any theology that empowers believers not to question is very dangerous. Mm -hmm. So the political attitude in Zimbabwe at the moment is not good. We're expecting men and women of God who 
do not select scriptures. We have few scriptures are not that are abused in Zimbabwe. Romans 13. All authority comes from God. All the leaders must be prepared. It's true. I've said it. Prayer is our lifestyle. But what if we are groaning in pain? What if these leaders have become brutal? Are there no scriptures in the Bible that tell us what to do? Don't we have, for example, the prophet Elijah, being sent by God to confront King Ab, who had seized Naboth's vineyard, the land question, the powerful, exploiting the weak people in society. Yeah. Don't we have Prophet Nathan going to King David and telling him yeah, yeah. he had committed adultery? He had made that. This is the prophet of God. But you hear people, even believers, saying there's no relationship between politics and religion. That's the lie of the devil. Because no one is living outside politics. We are governed by politics. Everywhere we are is politics. Therefore, I summon religious leaders not to be selective in terms of quoting scriptures and deploying them during this crisis moment. 2 Chronicles 7 verse 14 is one of the scriptures abused. If my people who are called by my name would have, yes, we believe in that. We need to call God. We need to repent. We need to humble ourselves. But look, I've asked a question, Anotina. Why are victims blamed? Why are victims? There are people who believe Zimbabwe is going through a crisis because of sins. And I ask them, which sins? Look at the constitution of Zimbabwe. They said to help with LGBT rights. They said to help with abortion and so forth. But we have other nations. We have legalized all these things. Why is God not punishing these nations? Yeah. And punishing Zimbabwe, who doesn't have those things even in their constitution, it defies logic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the culture of blaming the victims is not only in politics, but even when we look at the issues surrounding gender. Let me be very specific and give examples of this. If Professor Mary is right, you hear people in society, including women, they say, ah, what do you expect from a single woman? Single women in Vana, they are home wreckers. You know, she deserves it. But you know, you are not hurting Professor Bill. What you are doing is to energize the rapists. You are feeding them. Yeah. Wait until next, a phone for girl is wrapped. Mm -hmm. And what are you going to say? She was putting on a mini skirt. The rapist goes away. Mm -hmm. Nothing happens. What are you doing? You are energizing the rapist. Not only rapist, but rapist because they watch and they see. Our actions in society speaks louder than the words we speak. We speak yeah. Wait until a woman coming from the wilderness to pray, Kumaso, with white garment sweeping the soil. Mm -hmm. She doesn't have a biscuit. She is not a single woman. She is red. What is your explanation on that? You have been feeding rapists. Wait until a 70, 80 year old woman in the rural areas is raped. This has been the trend in the past, in the recent past. 25 year old man raps as a, a, an 80 year old woman. What is attractive on that grandma? Yeah, yeah. What is attractive? Wait and see this man raping a five-year-old girl. What is attractive on that five-year-old girl? It goes back to lack of mor morality in our society, degeneration of ethics, because we blame the victims. And as a result, we don't foresee what we are creating in our nation. A good example I was listening as a researcher when Joanna Mamamba of the NDC and her colleagues were abused, I heard the comments from when saying, where were they going? Mm -hmm. I don't support breaking COVID-19 laws. Mm -hmm. But to me, 
something is very wrong. If they broke the law of COVID, why can't we charge them on that law? And then deal with the perpetrators of violence. That silence is complicit. It has been happening over the years. When women are raped, particularly in crisis moments, they take advantage of the lawlessness and women suffer the most. And because there is no strong penalty, punishment given to this, we keep energizing them. We keep feeding them. It's not about the victim, but we are energizing them and we will have many casualties. That's why when it comes to sexual violence, I call upon men because it can be your daughter who can be raped. It can be your mother. It can be your sister. It can be your wife. We have a culture in Zimbabwe to say, Namo ya umma irambi gusadza. My neighbor's daughter was raped, therefore we don't care. Yeah. But you have to care because we are energizing evil in our society. We need to, it doesn't matter the person raped, it belongs to MDC or ZANU PF, as we see the trend right now. Until we transcend be, beyond party politics, we can't fix problem in Zimbabwe. We all know there are certain people from a certain party, when they commit crimes, they are not arrested. It's not, a, it's not an issue. But the petty, petty, petty crimes are innocent from other parties. It means they're in hot soap. But what are we doing? We are promoting lawlessness. We are not astute. And this is the reason why evaluating the leadership styles of, uh, of Robert Mugabe, I was saying he was a strong man. He was an icon with very good ideologies, but unfortunately, they led the Wupo to execute them practically. And as a result, we still feel the legacy. We are in a crisis because everything, there are deep rooted challenges in our nation emanating from gender issues and politics that we need to earnestly deal with. And I place the greater responsibility back to the religious leaders, not one man, but religious leaders, because we look at the churches as sanctuaries of hope. They remain beacons of hope for us. And when the, child, uh, the churches remain silent, we don't know where our communities will run to because we still have hope in our churches. Look at the decades, three decades, Zimbabwe in a mess, in a crisis. But look at the level of prayer, all night vigils, fastings, midnight prayers. We do them because we hope. But the question is, until when? Don't we need to put a limit on prayer and say, yes, we've been praying for three decades, but what is wrong? Then my comment is Pentecostalism, avoid, avoid the head-on confrontation with the political elite. They avoid that. When you ask them, some of them pretend to be busy. No, I've been busy. Every theology should address current issues. Not what happened 100 years ago. We are the here and now. We are in a crisis. We are hungry. We need more of social activism from our churches. Our churches are rich, Anna. I don't know if there's a church which is poor. Our churches are rich, but look at the level of reaching out in crisis. They are not really forthcoming. I know individuals have been helping and some churches have stretched for their hands. But my analysis, based on what I see, what I know in terms of the contributions, churches are rich and we expect them to do more in crisis moments. But their, their silence during the crisis is worrisome because we are saying the gospel should speak to our context. How do you read the crisis? as believers. What is the cause of the crisis? Yes, we have been praying for 30 years, almost 40, but the problems are worsening. Can't you stop and say, what is the crisis? Then I'll take the opportunity, I know to, start to address this popular thing of dialogue, dialogue, dialogue. From 2018, 
We are now in 2020. We hear religious leaders pressing for dialogue. Mm. I've asked some leaders, you guys tell me, what is the purpose of wasting state resources going for elections when every post-election period we hear of dialogue? Yeah. Why don't you remove elections on our constitutions and replace them with dialogue? The dialogue. And dialogue until you dialogue no more. Yeah, 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 yeah. You see, so we have a bunch of hypocrites mm -hmm. who don't want to face the truth until we tell ourselves the truth, until we live the truth, until we face reality. What do you want me to pray for? When we have been praying and we have a long list of corruption, issue, cases of corruption. I remember the 15 billion that missed during the theory started to come up. No, it wasn't 15 billion. No, 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 no. Theory is coming up to cover up. Mm. Why didn't we march in the streets of Zimbabwe to say we demand the 15 billion back mm. as a united? And from there, we are told to fast and pray. I was listening to one man of God for ethical reasons. I don't mention names. A few days ago, I was saying Zimbabweans need to pray. I wasn't expecting that from a man of God in this crisis. Don't you know, say what has been happening? Yeah, yeah, yeah. To punish people to continue fasting and fasting and praying and praying until when? Yeah. That is the answer. I believe God has answered our prayers over the decades. Everything is clear in Zimbabwe. We all know what to do, but we are hesitant to do what we should be doing. Yeah. Period. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, in conclusion, on the attitudes, we need religious leaders to empower citizens, a theology that empowers them to resist oppression, starting from the family. No one was created to be a sacrificial victim. No one owns another person. If people belong to God, people should save God. And the leaders must know that if they have been elected by the people, the people have the right to question them, because if I put you on this uh, position, and because I like you, I'm impressed by you. When things go wrong, I should be able to come and say, what is wrong, Anna? Yeah, yeah. But if politicians begin to tell the people, stay in your churches, why do you want our voices at the end of the day? You silence us to speak, but when it comes to voting time, you want to come and campaign on the pulpit. You want our voice. Then let them vote on their own. Let them leave the congregants. And the surprising thing, our most of our leaders, I don't want to say our, because there are some who are vocal. Most of our leaders are quiet. And the question is, are they beneficiaries? Are they beneficiaries? Yeah. So this is worrisome because when somebody is and is full, he doesn't know what to go to bed without even a piece of bread in the mouth is like. Look at the orphans out there. Look at the lockdown itself from March, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. And when many people are not employed, what are they eating in their homes? Mm -hmm. And no pastor should pretend as if everything is well. No pastor should pretend in our Shona language, there's a common word right now, which is being spoken all over. Yeah, 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 yeah. They know the truth, but mm -hmm. it is the time for every one of us to be honest with ourselves, mm -hmm. to say, what do we really want in our lives? What do we want in Zimbabwe? How do we pray? How do we uh, how do we understand God in this crisis? Is, the will, is this the will of God for Zimbabweans to suffer like this? Yeah. When everything is grounded, I am a bitter person, I know, because I lost my biological dad in 2008 at the peak of the crisis. Yeah. Not yeah. when parents to buy medicine. My father passed on in 2008. At the peak of the crisis, and most of us, we still have the scars of 2008. Mm -hmm. So any crisis like what we're experiencing right now for religious leaders 
to pretend as if all is well, that's great hypocrisy. So the attitude in general towards politics is not impressive. We need another level of engagement. Well, well, thank you very much for, for that response. I, I'm afraid I'm running out of time, but I still have one last question for you. Uh, generally, with regards to the relationship between religion and politics, do you think that religion uh, is is the power to transform the political landscape and as well as to empower the people themselves. Yes, religion is the power to transform the political landscape in Zimbabwe and even beyond. But unfortunately, unfortunately, we have the system, systems of oppression and exploitation in our churches they are the same with those in the political structures, such that at the end of the day, we are really questioning the validity of re religion in terms of development. Africa is the most religious continent, mm -hmm. but the poor continent. That iron itself speaks volumes of what is at stake. I maintain that religion is the capacity to transform, because there are a lot of good things that religion is done in our society in Zimbabwe. Yeah. We have mission hospitals, we have uh, universities, we have orphanage centers. It's noble, and we have to respect that. But as I pointed from the beginning to say that we have abuse of money in our specific churches, there is no accountability. And when you question, the devil is at work in the life of sister so and so or brother so because he's questioning the authority. That's where the touch not comes in. Yeah. Touch not the of God. It is wrongly deployed in the Pentecostal fraternity. If you check that one from the book of Psalms, you find that it refers to the whole of Israel. The patriarchs, the priests, yes, the patriarchs, the priests, the prophets, and the whole people as a whole. But now there are people who absolutely own that verse as if they refer to, and the touch not is not referring to, is referring to physical harm, not to speaking the truth. Yeah. I think. David demonstrated, illustrated that touch not God's anointed. He had all the capacity to kill Saul. But what did he do? He spoke the truth against Saul, but he didn't kill him. That's why he said, touch not. I will touch not God's anointed, but it didn't. He spoke the truth. So this is one area that congregants have been silenced by religious leaders. Why? Because there are some acts of thuggery, there is no accountability, some commit adultery, some still some do this, and they use that scripture to silence and threaten the congregants not to speak out, which is very bad. So that's why I encourage believers to read the Bible, to understand the Bible, and know what to do as believers. Mm -hmm. Well, Thank you very much for your time, Professor Kudzi. I, I'm happy to have had you on this conversation. Uh, I'd want to invite you to like and follow the conversation with Anotida Chikumbu on Facebook, and as well as to subscribe to the YouTube channel. I'm going to be inviting as many academics as possible uh, to have these cutting edge discussions on so many topics, so many themes uh, in the near future. Thank you very much for your time and have a good day. Thank you very much too. Bye. Wonderful.